Here in northern Florida, we find the remnants of a vast pine savanna ecosystem that survives only by the destructive force of fire. The cones of the longleaf pine trees can only germinate following a burn, and many other unique plants are only able to survive in the open conditions created by fire. Many of the animals that live here are found nowhere else on Earth, and some live their lives in nearly complete secrecy. The frosted flatwood salamander is unique to these scorched pine savannas. It is rarely seen, and it is quietly disappearing. In the past several decades, the flatwood salamander has uh, underwent precipitous population declines and extirpations. We're looking at about a 90% population decline since uh, 2000. And now in the Apalachicola National Forest, one of the last areas they still occur, we're down to less than 20 occupied breeding ponds. Most of those ponds only have one or two breeding females left. If conservation and recovery efforts stopped right now, flatwood salamander would probably disappear within 10 years. As with most endangered species, habitat loss is mostly to blame for this decline. But the salamanders are also disappearing from protected areas, and this problem lies with their reproduction. Flatwood salamanders live most of their lives in burrows, feeding on invertebrates. But on humid nights in fall and winter, they make their way to dry pond basins, where they mate and lay eggs underneath the native herbaceous vegetation layer. These plants form a layer of cool, humid air, protecting the eggs from drying out. Winter rains then fill the ponds, triggering the eggs to hatch. The larvae use their stripes to stay camouflaged amongst the submerged herbaceous plants, feeding on small aquatic invertebrates and growing throughout the winter. By the spring, the salamanders are ready to leave their underwater nurseries and begin to transform into their adult forms. Their stripes begin to fade and give way to their characteristic frosted patterning, and they develop eyelids and jaws, more suited for a life on land. Eventually, they leave the water and disperse into the surrounding landscape. Here, flatwood salamanders do something odd that we still don't understand. They climb into thick mats of wiregrass when entering and leaving their breeding ponds. This may help them better navigate their way around the flat landscape, but we still don't really understand why these salamanders climb. If they're lucky, these salamanders will return in a couple of years to the same ponds they grew up in to help usher in the next generation. In conservation areas like the Apalachicola National Forest, where we are now, the primary cause of decline has been um, alteration of the natural fire cycle. Uh, historically, fires would have occurred here in the late spring and early summer when their breeding ponds are dry and the ponds would have burned through during lightning ignited wildfires. Now we no longer have lightning ignited wildfires and they're replaced by prescribed fires, which are largely implemented during the cool, wet times of the year, um, particularly late winter and early spring. Therefore, the breeding ponds no longer burn through, they're no longer kept open and grassy, and they're filling full of shrubs and be ultimately become unusable for flatwood salamander reproduction. But a lack of proper breeding habitat may unfortunately be only one of two major threats to the survival of this little salamander. Another reason for decline is we're seeing an increase in the frequency and severity of droughts, especially during the winter. And we think that's associated with climate change. Uh, since 2000, we've had three major drought events, each consisting of multiple years of winter drought in which flatwood salamanders couldn't reproduce because their ponds neither filled or held water long enough for the larva to complete metamorphosis.
In order to improve uh, the landscape for flatwood salamanders, um, wetlands need to be restored if they're so far gone that they are, are, are these impenetrable thickets of shrubs and hardwood trees. We have to send hand crews in to cut and haul out the vegetation into the uplands where it can eventually be burned away. The stumps have to be herbicided so they don't resprout. And then you have to follow up that restoration effort with fire in the late spring and early summer uh, to burn out all the accumulated muck and thatch and uh, sticks and so forth and return the basin to an open and grassy condition. Also, we need to augment um, existing populations through head starting, um, which is where we collect eggs or larvae and raise them up to a larger size and release them. And then ultimately, we need to establish new populations of flatwood salamanders on the landscape, um, either by captive breeding and using those progeny um, as the source for reintroduction efforts or by translocating small proportions of healthy populations elsewhere. Fortunately, there are frosted flatwood salamanders in captivity, and researchers are working to successfully breed these captive salamanders to reintroduce their offspring back into the wild. The Amphibium Foundation founded to work with the uh, flatwood salamanders. That's why we started. Uh, we have between three and four hundred frosted flatwood salamanders here in our uh, captive program, um, which was originally formed to be an assurance colony against extinction as the populations continued to decline in the wild. In, uh, the secondary purpose of our program is to, a captive propagation program where we're learning how to breed the species in captivity to produce animals which would be candidates uh, for release back into the wild. In December 2021, the Amphibian Foundation reached a major milestone, becoming the first organization to successfully breed frosted flatwood salamanders in captivity. Although captive breeding is an essential component of the salamander's recovery, there must also be high quality habitat to release them into. In order for the flatwood salamander to have a future on our conservation lands that, like the Apalachicola National Forest, there needs to be a paradigm shift in how we apply prescribed fires to the landscape. Right now our priorities are fuel management and wildfire risk reduction. Um, we need a shift towards more ecological fire, which means an increase in frequency and a, paying close attention to the timing of fire. So we have the fullest breadth of ecological effects for both the uplands and the wetlands. So paying attention to ecological fire not only benefits the flatwood salamander, but a whole array of other plants and animals, including things like carnivorous plants, such as the hooded pitcher plant we have here. As a kid, I looked at pictures of frosted flatwood salamanders in field guides with wonder and awe. But only during my time working to save them did I realize just how easily they could go extinct within my lifetime. Very few people will ever see a flatwood salamander, but their anonymity should not doom them. In fact, most life is similarly small and unseen, but vital to functioning ecosystems nonetheless. The conservation of the flatwood salamander necessarily means a more complete conservation of the longleaf pine flatwoods that sustain them. This incredible ecosystem is home to biodiversity found nowhere else on the planet, and you can help preserve it without leaving your home. If you're able, please consider donating to the conservation organizations listed below this video. It won't be easy, but we can still have a chance at saving this amazing little salamander from anonymous extinction.